thought we would talk a little bit on, on sort of what we've heard today in terms of current best practices and some perspectives. Um, we heard uh, uh, from um, our, our first speaker, Wendy, the confusing nomenclature is a major challenge. Collaboration is key, and it can promote careers rather than destroy them. Mechanisms are needed for supporting young investigators, an area that we really do need to pursue. Um, it's important also to be sure what models and assumptions we've used, and I'll ask folks as I'm, as I'm talking to sort of jot down areas where we might uh, be able to, to develop some tools or, or uh, future research. Large projects stimulate technology development and vice versa. We heard some very good examples of this in the HAP map, which stimulated more rapid genotyping, which stimulated more genome-wide association studies, et cetera. Data sharing is crucial. I think, if, as, uh, as someone said, if you don't get a, come away with, uh, with that message from, from this workshop, we have failed miserably. Um, and uh, Debbie talked uh, about the need for tissue repositories for expression, function, methylation testing, and lots of things on the, on the horizon that, we're, or that we may not even be aware of just yet. Um, we also heard from Debbie that even though we're only capturing maybe a third of the variation in the genome, we're still finding things. So this works, and uh, we can expect to find even more things, perhaps of smaller effect, but of more interesting uh, uh, metabolic pathways as, as we go forward. Um, she also talked about the importance of translation, gave the example of VCOR C1 uh, and warfarin and how it's so very predictive of, of warfarin dosing, and yet we still don't have good ways of getting that into practice and of validating that rapidly and, and being sure that it should be in practice. We heard a lot about the importance of examining observed versus expected distributions of 500,000 SNPs. Uh, David talked about this as well as, as some others, and looking at QQ plots, quantile quantile plots, and other ways of, uh, of being sure that your data are not fooling you, uh, in, in, at least in the first, uh, the first blush. The importance of handling the DNA of the cases and controls similarly so that you don't introduce biases, and even though those biases may only affect a few SNPs, remember you're only pulling out a few from 500,000 or more of them. Uh, this doesn't bear repeating. Oh, sure it does. Replication, replication, replication um, is also another underlying theme of the, of the day. Um, and we heard from, from David and, and Bob that the CGEMS Association data are available now uh, if you're doing breast and prostate cancer studies for immediate, repli uh, for immediate uh, uh, replication of your findings. And those are, are freely available without uh, any need for, for request processes or approval. Uh, you heard from Elizabeth that genotype data are not infallible. Uh, we talked about QC filters, and uh, those, that's a genomicist term, um, but they're basically QC criteria. And there's a nice description of them in the replication paper that uh, was referred to by Stephen Chanak, who's the first author, uh, in, in Nature just a, a week or two ago. Uh, inspecting cluster plots, we saw some very good examples of why one wants to look at cluster plots, um, and also uh, the, the importance of knowing what sample type you're working from, whether it's buccal or, or uh, whole genome or amplified or cell line, and you need to be able to tell, um, to tell your lab that. Uh, we heard that CNVs, copy number variants, are very exciting. People are very, very interested in them. We need better detection software for them because they're not easy to pick out with current software. Um, and we also heard that more SNPs may not be better than more people. There, you do come to a point where you're, you've captured pretty much all of the information the genome has to, has to give you, in, at least in terms of SNP variation, uh, and yet you may, may want to have people with more um, uh, variation in other exposures and variants. Uh, we heard from Laura about the importance of planning for analysis, working with trial data sets that might be similar to your platform, and kind of getting geared up so that when these data, you know, come to overwhelm you, you're at least somewhat ready for them. Most of them are too large for, for the standard programs we've used in epidemiology, such as SAS, um, but there are programs that are widely available, uh, often free shareware, such as Plink and others, um, and it's good to, to sort of make yourself uh, familiar with those. It's also good to make yourself familiar with the use of genome browsers. Um, this is something that I think we could really contribute a lot to in epidemiology by annotating, as it were, the associations that we're seeing with diseases and traits and, you know, things like height and BMI and other stuff uh, that would be, be very informative um, uh, down the road. We also learned that unfiltered data, that is, those that the data that kind of don't pass your QC filters because they look funny, I think uh, Nancy called those fleas, um, uh, can, can really give you some very interesting clues. They also could be just plain wrong, but, uh, but we don't want to throw those away, and dbGaP is providing uh, those data. Collaboration does seem to be getting easier. We heard that from both Dan and Andy, that, uh, actually from several people, that as uh, people are recognizing the importance of this and how it does not seem to destroy careers and, in fact, does help, um, that, it, that it does uh, um, uh, seem to be, be getting a little bit easier. And Bob talked about multiple models of collaborations, shared collaborations, complementary where people have different parts of the, of the whole, and then apportioned where you really kind of separate out uh, uh, various disease areas. 
We also heard that DBGAP is going to accept association data as accessions, which is their way of saying here's a fact and we can number it and label it and, and find it in some other way. Um, and in fact, that will, will likely be required by, by some of the key journals uh, in the near future before they will publish associations. And documentation and display of protocols and, and thing, in studies like ARIDS and Framingham that, that Jim showed you really seem to be revolutionary for the, the epi field. The, the Framingham people kind of coming forward and, and saying, this is great, we can hardly wait to use it, you know, when they've had their, their data sets for 60 years and have managed them in a sort of a non-informatician uh, way is, is something that we really ought to take a lesson from as epidemiologists. Um, been, okay. And uh, genomics, in, in doing genomics in prospective population studies, we really do need to include participant involvement. Dan told some, some very uh, telling stories uh, about uh, experience in Framingham, uh, the need for multiple consent provisions and for tracking those provisions, which can be quite, quite cumbersome, and the need for ethical oversight. Uh, data sharing should be encouraged and planned for in advance. And, and the participants really do seem to want this. They want their data to be used. That's why they donated them. Uh, and then be sh being sure we sort of, if not future-proof our studies, at least future-plan our studies, recognizing that there are going to be new technologies coming down the pike. We need to get past the idea that every time you change a technology, you need a new consent for it, because that probably is not the case. It certainly wasn't the case in echocardiography or in x-ray or other things, and it's probably not the case in this field either. Um, and we did hear uh, concerns about the, the tenure system. Really, it applies to the promotion and award system and, and lots of other things, granting and funding, uh, that really do need to evolve evolve along with us, and we, we rec need to recognize that that does take some time, and so we'll need to, to nurture and, and encourage that change. Just a, a note of what some warm-up genotyping data sets might be. Uh, Andy mentioned the NINDS Open Access Repository. And I would remind you that all of these slides will be available on the GEI website, so don't feel you have to scribble down um, uh, various URLs. Um, the HapMap samples that were typed using the two platforms being used in the Genetic Association Information Network, those data are freely available. You can just click on them and download them, and that's the website there. Uh, and I might just mention that ways that population studies can be used in, in uh, really exploring genome-wide association is to kind of think of think about what the geneticists call the genetic architecture of complex traits. So how do you describe a gene, the number of loci, the frequencies, the type of loci, et cetera? We could describe the epidemiologic architecture of genetic variants, so kind of turning it on its head and, and looking at it from a, a different perspective. So what's the population prevalence of a variant that might be important, the, the, uh, uh, the SNP uh, in, in the the AQ24 region that's so strongly associated with prostate cancer. What's its prevalence in different uh, groups of different uh, uh, ancestral origin? Relative risk of rigorously defined incident disease can be done in population-based prospective cohort studies that, you know, better than anywhere else. Consistencies of associations across subgroups defined by different characteristics. Potential modifiability of associated risks. Are these things that are, that are modifiable or not? Do they change with environmental exposures, et cetera, with treatment? correlations with other traits and exposures. And is there some way, then, to use our population-based studies to say, all right, tell me everything you can about the SLC30A8 variant that is associated with diabetes? Wouldn't it be neat if you could look up in a database or call up a, a prospective study uh, investigator and say, you know, tell me what, what is the prevalence in your population and, and what are the, the correlates of it uh, and what is the risk and what are the modif modifiers of that risk, et cetera? And we might even be able to identify potential clues to gene function. So we might, if we knew that, um, that the AQ2 variant was associated with hormone levels and other things, uh, we, we might then um, uh, give us some clues as to what, what exactly that gene does. So this is an area that really is ripe for epidemiology to be involved in. And I would just uh, uh, sort of harken back to that first uh, scan that we saw from, from, actually I didn't show this, but the macular degeneration scan that showed a very strong association in complement factor H. And we heard that there hasn't been a lot of work following up, you know, sequencing that. There has been some work, though, in population-based studies done by uh, David Hunter and others uh, uh, here in the, in the nurses, I believe it was, David, uh, looking at risk of developing macular degeneration by this variant and modifiable risk factors. And Marta alluded to this earlier, uh, finding that that association really is modified by the two other major risk factors for macular degeneration, uh, obesity and, and current smoking, in which the risk is much higher if you have that exposure. Um, so I think overall we've, we've heard that these really are areas that are coming, that are converging, and, and epidemiology has a lot to contribute to this. Uh, I'm, I'm very fond of showing this Gary Larson uh, cartoon. Well, what have I always said? Sheep and cattle just don't mix um, when, when considering genomicists and, and epidemiologists. And I think that, that the, the days of that are past happily, um, and uh, now we'll sort of move to a panel discussion of, of what kinds of tools and approaches we need to, to facilitate that. Thank you. <laughs>